there's an epidemic of pediatric mental health challenges that is unfolding in the United States and around the world. There are millions upon millions of children who are struggling to function, who are struggling to be, or frankly, just trying to survive. Millions of children who are challenged by autism, and every day is a struggle for them. Every day, they're just overwhelmed. Sadly, some disabled. And this conversation, this presentation is meant to bring hope, is meant to bring awareness, hopefully bring about change, get into the hands of researchers, policymakers, and others who can ultimately do something about this at a higher level. This presentation is to help you understand how mold toxicity can be significantly tied to the presentation of autism. And I hope you will watch and view with an open mind and objectively look at the data that is being presented and assess for yourself how real this connection is. Why is this conversation so important? One in 10 to one in two, 10% to 50 percent of all children, not just children with autism, of all children are exposed to mold. As a pediatrician, what terrifies me is what happens when this exposure happens in utero, because mold toxins can pass through the placenta. What happens if this exposure happens in the first few years of life? when that child's nervous system, immune system, gastrointestinal tract, organs of detoxification are just developing. This exposure is significant, and this isn't just some random reference. This is the US EPA that shows that between 8% and 54% of homes can have mold. What is terrifying is that with climate change, we, we now have flooding in just about everywhere. There, there is no area of the country. There, there are no regions of the world, sadly, that are now incapable of being flooded. And when there is flooding, the risk of mold goes up to 45%, with 17%, one in five, of these homes having heavy amounts of mold. This presentation is to help you understand what this means, what this impact can do. And it's not a presentation about fear at all. I hope this is a presentation to bring awareness, to help empower you to understand, to bring about change, to help policymakers, legislatures, researchers, physicians start looking at this. Because that is how we bring about change, together understanding how this high prevalence of exposure could be impacting some of the very things that we are seeing in epidemic proportions and what to do about it. Mold exposure could be prevented. Mold exposure could be treated. Mold toxicity for the most part can be healed. And I've seen children who were struggling in profound ways, poor children, on the spectrum who were just constantly overwhelmed. Literally just, I can't handle the world. I can't handle the world. When I can't handle this. This is too much. Suddenly be comfortable in the world. Suddenly be happy in the world. Suddenly be enjoying the world. Not be overwhelmed. Children who couldn't function, who, couldn't, who were struggling to learn, who were struggling to just be in the classroom, suddenly being comfortable in the classroom. Some having the ability to learn, those on the spectrum. And I've, I've seen hundreds of kids that are non-autistic suddenly going from being the kids who were failing school to now being the top student in the school. The kids that wanted to quit suddenly loving to learn. Profound change is possible when we can get to a place of understanding, 
But that understanding starts with having a conversation, and that is what this presentation is about. Why do I care about this so much? Because I was one of the kids that I have helped. Some would argue that I have a certain degree of neurodivergence because sadly I miss a lot of social cues and there are a lot of things that come easy to other people that don't come easy to me. I had a lot of anxiety as a kid. And when I see the kids who struggle, I see myself in them. So all of this stuff that is here has been there for one reason, to help me understand how to help these kids. And frankly, to understand how to better help myself, how to heal myself. There are many unusual clinical findings found and tied to children that are on the spectrum. All of these findings can be explained by mold exposure. Not to say the mold exposure is the only cause of all of these, by any means. There are many other things that can cause these. There are not that many things that can cause all of these at the same time. Mold exposure can explain all of these at the same time, especially if that exposure is happening in utero in early on in life. Children with autism have mitochondrial abnormalities, and I will demonstrate to you how mold toxicity can cause significant mitochondrial abnormalities. Mold toxicity can cause reactive oxygen species and high oxidative stress. Mitochondrial abnormalities and high oxidative stress turn into severe brain fog, which is one of the common things that I see in a lot of the parents whose children have various kinds of learning abnormalities, which is a big red flag to me of the possibility of mold. These kids have abnormal sensory pathways where the world is constantly overwhelming them. They can't handle clothing. Everything is overwhelming their senses. They have changes in their nervous systems where their brain cells are being harmed. The myelin sheath, the coating of the neurons is affected. They have inflammation. They have abnormalities in how their brain is wired. These children have abnormal immune responses and strange things like the family members having allergy reactions. These children have abnormalities in their microbiome, abnormalities in levels of candida, intestinal permeability, which is leaky gut. They have higher rates of food allergies. They have higher rates of inflammatory bowel disease, two to 300% higher rates of inflammatory bowel disease than others. The immune system, not just in their gut, but in their brain is activated, triggering a fear response. Their blood brain barrier is disrupted. Their glutamate systems are disrupted. They have abnormalities in folate levels within their nervous system. They have weird motor tics and EEGs abnormalities and more. Every single one of these things can be explained by mold toxicity. And sadly, when you step beyond the world of autism, you find that many of these things are also found in children with pans and pandas and other learning and mental health challenges. This presentation is not to say that this is the cause in every child who presents with autism or other neurological abnormalities. It is simply to say that these links are real and we do not know how often this correlation exists. Sadly, there is a woefully inadequate amount of data looking at how mold toxicity is currently impacting autism. Or at this time, about 20 studies in total, in total, in all the research that has been done, despite all these correlations. And this is the sad reality. We are so completely ignorant to this link that we are completely missing it. And part of that is, frankly, our diagnostic modalities are pitiful. Our ability to test the environment is inadequate. So it's being missed all the time by mold inspectors. And we'll get into that 
Physicians have no understanding of this. They, they run regular labs and miss it. And so we are potentially missing the elephant in the room because of our lack of understanding and awareness. And that is what this presentation is meant to address. From the data that we do have, what we see is that children who are on the spectrum have much higher prevalences of mold toxins within their system than kids who are not. According to one researcher, Dr. Andrew Campbell, and there is some controversy around Dr. Andrew Campbell, but Dr. Andrew Campbell believes that upwards of 50%, 50% of children who have autism likely have that autism because of mold toxicity. Now, let's say Dr. Andrew Campbell is completely off. Let's say he's completely off and the controversy is completely real and he, he has no idea what he's talking about. And let's say just 5%, let's say 10% of autism is actually mold toxicity. That's still a staggering amount that should be taken very, very seriously. And I, for one, in certain other experts who are very familiar with mold believe that it's absolutely higher than 5 to 10%. Is it 20%? Is it 30%? Is it 40%? We have no idea. And that is the thing that is most troubling. By the time you have looked at all of the data, I think you will agree with me that we need to be looking at this in a significantly more careful fashion and dedicating a lot more resource in terms of research, in terms of policy, in terms of testing to not just see the correlation scientifically, but understand how often this exposure is taking place. How does it happen? I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. In the last 50, 60 years, homes have started in the US being built with drywall, which means that any water penetration, literally any water penetration, any leak, if you expose the drywall to that moisture because drywall has paper and paper happens to have mold spores built into it because trees have mold, water plus drywall causes mold growth. You have enough mold growth even one time those molds produce mycotoxins, and those toxins then leach into the environment. But it's not just the drywall. You can have mold growth in air conditioning units, in the subfloor of the house, in the attic of the house, behind certain appliances. And I've seen all of these. And sadly, based on current OSHA standards, all mold experts, all mold inspectors are currently looking for catastrophic amounts of mold to the point where you look, you're like, wow, that ceiling is about to collapse because of water damage. And oh my God, there's so much mold. So what they do overlook is, well, you have a small amount of mold and that, that small amount of mold is, is not significant, except this is a person who has no medical background. They have no healthcare background. They have zero understanding of the physiological effects of mold. They have zero understanding of the science. And so they look and they say, well, your, your child's room has a little bit of aspergillus, and, but that's not, that's not real. That's, that's not significant because at the big scheme of things, that, that, that's normal, except that aspergillus, that black mold is nowhere else in the environment. It's not from the outside. It's not in the living room. It's just in the child's bedroom, which this inspector somehow thought is not a big deal. And I've seen many cases of exactly that. So right now, at a policy level, we are telling mold inspectors, look for catastrophic amounts of mold and anything less than catastrophic amounts of mold, call it normal. I will demonstrate to you the science, the literature that shows that subtoxic, small, tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of mold are enough to cause harm. And at a policy level, Given the cost, given the significant cost to child, to family, to society, we need to start looking at this differently. It goes beyond the environment because we believe 
that the government is controlling all mold exposure through the diet. And the FDA is doing a lot. It's not to say they're not. But when you look, and this, this is a published study, you see that ochratoxin and zeroralanone, which are two pretty significant toxins, are not regulated by the US FDA, even though they are regulated very tightly in the EU. And when you look at the levels that are set within the US in terms of what would trigger an alarm to say there's mold contamination, you can see that sometimes they are 10 times or more in a higher level than, than what would be accepted in the EU. And this is all to say that mold exposure can also happen through the diet. What are the foods that are most contaminated? Dairy, grains, corn, peanuts. And when you look at some people who eliminate gluten and dairy, and they're like, wow, after a month or two, I just feel better. Or what is the most common treatment that we use for children on the spectrum? Gluten, -free, gluten and dairy-free diets. Except they say, you need to keep your child on that diet for three to four months to see change. Except, you know, right now we say, well, you need to do that because that's how long it takes for the immune system to change. Except the immune system does not take, even the delayed immune response doesn't take two to three months. It takes a few weeks. What does take a few months to change is the levels of mold toxins within the body when you eliminate foods that are adding to the toxic burden. This is not to say that mold toxicity happens through food. It is to say that mold toxins can add to the overall burden and toxic load in the body, which then can be sufficient to cause problems. This is where, as a pediatrician, it, it troubles me. It breaks my heart. It terrifies me. Because what we know is that mold exposure can happen through the placenta and through the breast milk. How many millions of babies who are yet to be born into this world may be exposed to mold? And sadly, because mold toxins concentrate through the breast milk, what are the mammary glands? They're essentially filters, right? They filter nutrients from mom's blood supply, concentrate it into the breast milk to then pass those nutrients on to the baby. In the process of filtering all of this, guess what else they concentrate and filter? Any and all toxins that are floating through the bloodstream. So we have a baby who was exposed in utero while every single system is developing, while their neurons, their brain cells are developing, while their neurons are forming connections and breaking connections that don't belong while the gastrointestinal tract is developing, while the immune system is developing, while every single system is developing, this baby is being exposed. And I will show you the data to show and demonstrate to you the potential harm that can happen through this exposure. But it's not just that. Then this baby is born and this baby comes into this world. And every time this baby breastfeeds, they get a dose of mold toxins, and these toxins get into their gastrointestinal tract. And as their microbiome, as their gastrointestinal tract develops, these mycotoxins are constantly being dumped into the child's gastrointestinal tract, which is when the microbiome is supposed to develop normally. And I'll show you the data that shows that children with autism have abnormal microbiomes and how mold toxicity can perfectly explain that how children with autism have abnormal gastrointestinal tracts, have abnormal immune responses in the gastrointestinal tract, and how mold toxins can perfectly explain that, especially when it happens early on. I wish it was just that. I wish it was just the intrauterine exposure. I wish it was just through the breastfeeding. But think about what babies do as they're developing. They crawl. How far off the ground are babies? Six to 12 inches, which is where they're inhaling everything that's there. 
And it's not just they're inhaling everything that's there. What else do they do? They stick everything into their mouths. Babies are human vacuum cleaners. They stick everything into their mouths. They stick their hands in their mouth as they're calling around. Where do mold spores and mold toxins land? In the dust, on the ground. They're relatively heavy compounds that ultimately fall to the ground. And such, it's entirely possible that babies ultimately have the highest amount of exposure of all people in a moldy exposure, moldy exposed home because of this, all at a time where they're just developing the ability to detoxify and, and just forming their microbiome and just pruning their immune system and their nervous system and so forth. And this is why as a pediatrician, I am so concerned of what this exposure can do. But it's not just mold toxins. Sadly, even those people that are eating the most organic, clean diets, they're, they're living the healthiest lives possible. They're still exposed. Plastics are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They're in everything. Even when we eat organic diets, we're still getting exposed to pesticides in at least small amounts. There are some heavy metals in, in the cereals that our kids are eating. So these exposures happen. And when you add to that the exposure of mycotoxins in the womb, in the breast milk, and ultimately in the environment, that combination is sufficient to potentially cause harm, especially when it happens early on. So if environmental toxins are sufficient to load the gun, I believe that in some children, and we don't know what percentage, we don't know which children, but I do believe that mycotoxins are sufficient to pull the trigger. And what do we see in cases of regressive autism? Kid was doing fine, kid was doing fine, kid was doing fine, and then somewhere around 14 to 18 months, everything falls apart. The system completely collapses. The nervous system of the child completely collapses. And a seemingly benign antibiotic, some kind of other exposure, a little virus, inoculation, whatever, caused the, the system to completely collapse. And we pay so much attention to that trigger, and yet we somehow overlook why that child's system was so vulnerable to begin with, to allow whatever stressor that showed up to cause the system to collapse. And this presentation is to help you understand all of the things that mycotoxins can do to completely erode the vitality and resiliency of a system to make it so vulnerable that any exposure, antibiotic, virus, any exposure is enough to cause that system to fall apart. What about the mitochondria? Mold toxins can disrupt just about every single part of the mitochondria. What are the mitochondria? They're essentially the generators of our body, of our cells. Each cell has countless mitochondria that ultimately take the food we eat and ultimately convert it to ATP. ATP is the energy of life. The mitochondria have essentially a conveyor belt process, an assembly line. And through that assembly line, they take food in its basic forms and spit out ATP. This assembly line can be disrupted in multiple areas, which can then disrupt energy production. And one of the most common things that we see with mold toxin exposure is this weird state of fatigue. Many adults say, God, yeah, I'm just tired. I don't understand. I'm just tired all the time. I have to drink 15 cups of coffee just to get going. God, I wake up so tired in the mornings and then I just feel like I need to take a nap. What else can mitochondrial imbalances do? That's a weird state of brain fog which is something else that a lot of adults who are exposed complain of. God, yeah, my memory is just not good. I just, I've become forgetful. Yeah, I'm, I'm just feeling foggy. It's ultimately not just the mitochondria. 
you get larger disruptions in metabolism. You get a surge of oxidative stress. What is oxidative stress? Oxidative stress is basically a rusting phenomenon, if you were to look at it as such, within the body. You get reactive oxygen species, which are these compounds that ultimately drive oxidative stress. And all of these findings have been tied to children who have autism. It's not just a disruption in the mitochondria and their conveyor belt process. The repair mechanisms of the mitochondria, so just like the human body, the mitochondria have processes and mechanisms to protect themselves, to repair themselves. These processes are also disrupted by exposure to mold toxins. So not only do the mitochondria get disrupted in their ability to produce energy, they also are incapacitated in their ability to heal themselves. And through that, what ultimately happens is a significant hit to the nervous system. Because when you think about what do brain cells need to do what they do, how do brain cells function? How do they send signals back and forth? How do they communicate to one another? Ultimately, all processes that are tied to brain function are dependent on ATP, are dependent on the mitochondria. And through that, when there is a disruption, you get essentially this disruption of how the brain cells can function because they lack energy. It's like trying to drive your car with no gas. It doesn't work. And through that disruption, a very weird thing happens. So one, because the brain cells are not working, because the brain cells are not working, you get brain fog. Brain fog is basically these ion gradients, these neurotransmitters not functioning, this intracellular signaling, the, the cells signaling back and forth, all of that gets mucked up. And that is what we call brain fog. That is what we call processing issues. That is what we call potentially ADD, these, these kids that can't retain information, that can't learn for the life of, life of them. You have oxidative stress on top of neuronal dysfunction secondary to mitochondrial issues, we get severe state of brain fog, which is what is showing up ubiquitously now in normal typical children who are struggling to function. When you talk to these kids, it's not just they're distractible. They are distractible. They also have a hard time retaining and processing information. Beyond the neuronal dysfunction. There's a specific part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is an area that is responsible for handling the flow of information into the brain. It's like the traffic control center of the brain. Within the traffic control center of the brain, there are these peralbumin interneurons. They're GABAergic interneurons. What are GABAergic interneurons, they're essentially the traffic control cops of the brain within the traffic control center. These are the cops, these are the cells that are like, whoa, 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 too much information. You need to slow down. You, 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 you information come, you need to stop. And when you look at complex health, complex information processing within the brain, what do our bodies and our nervous systems have the wonderful capacity to do? to shut out information we don't need to be paying attention to, like the feeling of our pants, like the sound from our neighbor who is tapping his pen and the clock that's clicking and the air conditioning that happens to be running, you know, all of those environmental stimuli, the brain typically has the ability to shut off that excess information so we can do what? We can be present to what is being taught to us. What happens in cases of ADHD or ADD? When you look at what a lot of these kids have the inability to do, they have the inability to shut out all of that excess information that is extraneous. What about these poor children with autism? Take that inability, amplify it tenfold. 
And that is what these poor kids have to contend with on a daily basis. For these kids, every moment of every day is like going into a battlefield. What is that? They're trying to protect themselves from all of this information that is slamming into their nervous system at one time. Why, why do they do this? They're telling us, it's too much. It's too much. I can't handle it. And yet, we, what do we do? We sedate these kids? Let, let's give them more GABA. Let's give them more L-theanine if, if we want to be holistic. And if, if you're not, then let, let's just put them on guanfacine. Let's, let's put them on other medications. They're telling us it's too much information. Why do they have too much information? Because their brain's ability to control it is distorted. It turns out these paralvulin inner neurons, these GABAergic inner neurons, are entirely dependent to effectively function based on energy. And when there is some kind of disruption in energy production, their ability to control the flow of information gets disrupted. I wish it was this was the only piece. There's actually more to this picture that we'll get to in a later part of this presentation. This is just one part of how information processing gets distorted. Deficits in these paralvulin inner neurons, these GABAergic inner neurons, have been associated with autistic spectrum as well as schizophrenia because of the abnormal social and sensory gating. This data is real. This is not imaginary. And yet we are not talking about it. We're not even looking at it because we're so focused on everything else. Mycotoxins can do a lot more than just that. They can cause cell death, apoptosis. They can lead to disruptions of the cytoskeleton and ultimately demyelination. They can cause an inflammatory response within the nervous system, and we'll touch on this more in a minute. They can disrupt neuroplasticity. They can ultimately change parts of the hippocampus that's tied to memory and learning. Look at what is happening to these children. All of these things have been clinically demonstrated to be tied to autism spectrum. And imagine this happening in her intrauterine while the baby is developing. Imagine this happening in that first year of critical neuronal development. And yet we are not even talking about this. What about the immune system? What do mycotoxins do to the immune system? Well, it turns out that at a very high level, Inflammasomes are basically the A to Z process of immune regulation from the moment that the gene is decoded to ultimately how that information is turned into proteins and what happens to those proteins that ultimately affect the cell. An inflammasome is that entire A to Z process. Mycotoxins can literally disrupt the entire A to Z process of immune regulation. And these inflammasomes have been tied to the manifestation of autism. In animal studies, they have found that when pregnant pigs are exposed to mycotoxins, what ultimately happens is that their fetuses were then born after that exposure, where the exposure is gone, the exposure happened interutero, the baby is born, no more exposure, their immune systems are still completely dysregulated. So not only does mother's immune response get distorted, which is commonly found in children with autism, their immune system is distorted after the exposure has already happened because all of that immune priming was taking place intrauterine. The exposure changed the settings 
and functionality of the immune response, which then causes a perpetual abnormality in the immune response in that offspring that is now born. And what you can see is that very small amounts of exposure can be sufficient to ultimately cause an immune distortion. So these small amounts that these inspectors say, well, that, that amount of mold can't cause any harm. That amount of mold can very realistically cause harm. And yet we are completely overlooking it. And all of our mold inspectors are still taught from an understanding of 20 years ago of like, well, catastrophic amounts of mold are, are bad and you should check for that. And if it's not catastrophic, it's not a problem. So don't, don't call it a problem. And what we see over here is that this connection between intrauterine exposure early exposure is significant. It has significant long-term implication, imp implications. These children have an immune response that may be forever altered from that early exposure. And that exposure can ultimately manifest in mood and cognitive abnormalities which we see in children with autism, we see children with pans and pandas, we see children with anxiety. And yet we are not even talking about this. We're not even researching it. We're not even looking at this. Our, our government officials, our physicians, our researchers are, are completely unaware that this link is even possible. What about the microbiome? What about the gastrointestinal tract? Well, let's just look at it from a really simplistic standpoint. Where do most antibiotics come from? Why is penicillin called penicillin? Penicillin is called penicillin because it came from penicillium. Penicillium is a type of dangerous, toxic mold. It turns out that most mold toxins have some amount of antimicrobial property. This stool study that's to the right is from one of my patients that had heavy mold exposure, and you can see all of the beneficial bacteria are kaput. If a baby is born with mold toxins already in their system, Every time they come to feed, they get a dose of mold toxins that are essentially antimicrobial. What happens to their microbiome? What happens to their microbiome? What happens to the beneficial bacteria that we want to be there to control their immune system? And yet what we find in children with autism is exactly this. Their microbiomes are weirdly distorted in ways that we actually cannot even really describe. We don't even understand why it is that these children have the weird abnormalities in their microbiome. And that's why these stool transplants are so effective, because what are you doing? You're replacing the entire microbiome. God, wouldn't it make a lot more sense if we could prevent this from happening in the first place rather than waiting for the catastrophe to unfold and take heroics like doing a stool transplant? Through awareness, through education, through information, we can change this. We can ultimately screen pregnant women early on to see if they're being exposed. And if they are, as a society, help take care of this. Because at the end of the day, even if we pay for every single home to be remediated and not have significant amounts of mold, that's a hell of a lot cheaper than paying for a child to have to live a life of autism for the rest of their life. We are spending billions upon billions, like in the tunes of 200 plus billions dollars, billion dollars per year, taking care of these poor children who are left incapacitated, who are left struggling, who are left just trying to survive. If we took literally one-tenth, one-one-hundredth of that amount of money and paid for homes to be cleaned and homes to be taken care of, which could actually create more jobs and ultimately help communities, 
that money could, the return on investment could be staggering. We are not even talking about this. We don't, we're, we're not even paying attention to this. Government officials, researchers, policymakers, it, it hasn't even crossed their minds to look at this link. We, we are not even having a discussion in terms of how we can better invest our societal money to take care of our communities. What happens when the microbiome is disturbed other than the fact that the microbiome is being disturbed? What do, the, what do these bacteria do? All of these beneficial bacteria don't just control the immune system. They actually keep undesirable other microbes, opportunistic microbes like candida from getting out of line. That's like having a community where 99% of the people are really good. And if you have one bad actor, the 99% will be like, son, you, you need to settle down. You, you're, you're acting a little irrational right now and you need to settle down. It's like the church community coming and saying, son, we need to talk. Now let's say that church community, that, that community is completely distorted. In, in fact, the 99% go down to the 30%. And now the bad actors are almost outnumbering the good people. All of a sudden, those bad actors have free reign to do whatever they please. And guess what? When that happens, all of these opportunistic infections, these opportunistic microbes like candida, we all have candida. If, if you think you don't have candida, you, you're sadly mistaken. Every single person on this planet has candida. Every single person in this planet has opportunistic microbes. We all have small amounts of very bad actors in our gastrointestinal tract. It just happens that they are so outnumbered by beneficial bacteria that they can't cause any harm. Now, one of the things that I've had many families tell me is, God, my son was doing so well. My daughter was doing so well. And then she got this round of amoxicillin and everything completely fell apart. If the gut was barely hanging on, let's say there were 70% beneficial bacteria, 20, 30% bad actors, but it was still sufficient to the point where the beneficial bacteria were still keeping the others in check. And now the seemingly benign amoxicillin round knocked that 70% down to 40%, down to 50%. That slight, seemingly slight, small change could have been sufficient to cause one of these other microbes, including candida, to suddenly get, to suddenly get out of line and trigger an entire cascade of events, which then shows up as something like autism or pans and pandas or anxiety. If you look around and you talk to enough families whose children have some kind of learning or behavioral challenge, you will find a lot of families say, yeah, my kid was doing okay. God, they got that antibiotic and all hell broke loose. They haven't been the same, and it could be eczema. It could be a host of other diseases. When you look at these mechanisms, you get to a place where you start getting this terrifying thought of like, oh my God, how many of these poor kids are being exposed to mold toxins and we are completely missing it? Once Candida, who is normally harmless, gets out of control, it morphs. It goes from, you know, the good kid that has a few extra tattoos but isn't really acting out to the thug that's now carrying a gun and a bat and is intent on robbing every single home that they come across. Candida literally morphs once it sees it has the opportunity to cause harm. Once it senses that its environment is now opportune. It changes, it morphs, and through that actually becomes aggressive. It becomes invasive. What about the gastrointestinal tract? We're going to talk about candida and its form a little bit more in just a minute, but what about the gastrointestinal tract as a whole? Well, 
Mycotoxins have a remarkable a remarkable ability to cause leaky gut. They cause intestinal permeability. How did they do that? By not only damaging, not only damaging the glue, these occludin proteins, these tight junction proteins are basically the glue that keeps the gastrointestinal tract together because the gastrointestinal tract is basically a line of cells that are all glued together to form that critical lining that is important for gastrointestinal tract health. Mold toxins basically not only dissolve that glue, they disrupt that glue, they actually mess up the genes that are needed to produce the glue. So the glue is disrupted and the, the process behind making more of that glue is disrupted to the point where the gut even cannot repair itself. One of the things that I have seen is the children in my practice who have the worst of the worst gut issues, the kids who one probiotic and a little supplement doesn't fix their gut. Those are the kids that typically have mold toxin exposure. It's not just a leaky gut. Ultimately, these kids start developing damage to the gastrointestinal tract, so they can't absorb nutrients effectively. They start getting weird states of failure to thrive where they're not growing because they can eat fine, but ultimately those nutrients don't get absorbed into the body. And it turns out that leaky gut, and I'll demonstrate later, weird nu nutrient abnormalities, weird mineral abnormalities like zinc deficiency can be tied to autism. And again, it doesn't take a whole lot of these mycotoxins to cause a problem. You can see th these are tiny, tiny, seemingly in insignificant amount of mold toxins that's sufficient to cause this disruption. So this conversation of, well, it's a small amount of mold, it can't be a problem, is completely ridiculous when it comes to human health, especially when it comes to a baby's health. Now, what happens when all of this disruption takes place? Well, it turns out that when you get a disruption in intestinal permeability, that, that leaky gut ultimately allows foods and proteins that typically don't belong in the inner lining of the gastrointestinal tract to get into that inner lining. What is in that inner lining? The immune system. When the immune system starts having a inappropriate interaction, an inappropriate exposure to these proteins within the gastrointestinal tract, what does that do? That ultimately causes an abnormal immune response, which is ultimately what causes food allergies and food sensitivities. What do kids with autism have in abnormal amounts? Higher rates of food allergies and food sensitivities. When you see a person, child or an adult, that has 15,000 food reactions, where they have more foods that they can't eat than they can eat, a lot of those people have had or have mold exposure. And this is the reason why. There are not too many things that can cause this array of abnormalities. And what this research is talking about is that early, early exposure deserves special attention why does it deserve special attention? Because early exposure in that infant's early life is sufficient to cause a barrier function abnormality, which can then cause allergies later in life. So it doesn't have to be that this child has been exposed for 15,000 years. It could be that the child was exposed in that first year or two, and now the family moved somewhere else but that early exposure was sufficient to cause harm and cause the abnormalities that we are seeing today. This is something we see in children with autism. Beyond the food allergies, beyond the food sensitivities,
What also happens is when that barrier function is disrupted, when that line of cells that are glued together become disrupted, bacteria and other antigens, we call them other proteins, but specifically the bacteria also start entering into the gastrointestinal tract lining. The entry of pathogens into the gut lumen, the gut lining, is ultimately a key step in the induction and persistence of inflammatory bowel disease. This is the words of a researcher. I have seen several cases of early, early inflammatory bowel disease, and those children did have mold exposure. Children with autism have a much higher rate of developing inflammatory bowel disease in comparison to peer controls. Now, one of the findings that has been demonstrated clearly in children with autism spectrum are these abnormal folate receptor antibodies. What are folate receptor antibodies? Well, these are basically antibodies, immune proteins that go and plug the part of the transport system that is meant to shuttle folate B9 into the cerebral spinal fluid. We find that children with autism have abnormalities in folate cerebral spinal fluid levels, and I'll touch on that later on. And they also happen to have higher levels of folate receptor antibodies in the general population. How does this show up? Let's say you have the child that was doing really well, or well enough, they were talking, they were making eye contact, and suddenly there is a loss in language. Suddenly that child's nervous system shut down. Suddenly that child was lost. When you look at what B9 or folate does within the nervous system, and that's well beyond the point of this conversation, folate is responsible for just about every single neurochemical production within the brain. It's, it's, it's such an important compound in so many different things, and it should be obvious to us all that we need folate for the nervous system to function. When you have a sudden spike in these folate receptor antibodies, Essentially, what they do is they plug up the transporters that allow this folate to get into the nervous system and suddenly cause a drop in folate levels, which can then manifest as unusual things such as regressive autism. And this, this has been published. What I would like for us to think about, and this, this is something for some reason the autism community is not asking. It's great that they're looking at this and they're describing this and they're treating it by giving mega, mega, mega doses of folate. You know, most vitamins have 50 micrograms of folate. These children are on 50, or sorry, 5,000 micrograms of folate. 5,000 micrograms of folate, where a typical vitamin has 50 micrograms of folate. Why? Because they're basically just bombarding the nervous system with so much folate that ultimately some of that folate has to get in, and it has been shown to be helpful. A lot of psychiatrists are using high doses of folate for other neurological abnormalities, ADHD, anxiety, other things, except they're not asking, well, why in God's good earth do I have to give this obscenely high dose of folate for this child to get better? And that is what we need to be asking. Well, let's, let's consider a possibility. If you've got abnormalities in the microbiome and the microbiome, which is basically the fungal makeup of the gut, you have a leaky gut, you've got an abnormal immune response, basically the entire gastrointestinal tract goes kaput. And we know that most immune reactions start within the gastrointestinal tract. Is that sufficient to cause the triggering of an immune response that ultimately causes these folate receptor antibodies to show up? The honest answer is we don't know. There's actually no study that has yet to look at this. I can tell you clinically, based on my experience with many kids who have folate receptor antibodies, and I check this regularly in my patients, a higher, much higher percentage, over 50% of kids with folate receptor antibodies ultimately had mold exposure. 
Does that mean that all children have it? Absolutely not. Does it mean that a large percentage in the larger population do? We don't know. But we're not even looking at this. We're not even asking the questions. We're happy to give the megadoses of folate without even asking why these, these antibodies showed up in the first place. But it's more than that. There are a mind-boggling number of articles and books that have come out talking about the gut-brain axis and how the gut affects the brain and how it affects the brain chemistry and how it affects this and how it affects that. Well, my God, if the gastrointestinal tract is a complete train wreck, how does that affect the gut-brain axis? And if toxins are sufficient to cause this train wreck, then isn't it a good idea for us to look at this? Yet we are paying almost no attention to this at all. This is where things actually even get more weird. And in fact, in my opinion, a lot more concerning. So molds in mold toxins have a remarkable ability to activate mast cells, which means that they, they have an ability to really turn on these mast cells, bother these mast cells. So if you can imagine the most annoying person in your life just constantly nagging in your ear all the time to the point where you're like, oh my God, I'm about to lose my head. Mold toxins can cause exactly that kind of a reaction in mast cells to the point where the mast cells become irrational in their activity and hyperactive in their activity. And once mast cells become activated, they release histamine. I'll tell you why that is so important. What do we see in children with autism? Well, one of the things we see in children with autism is unusually high rates of allergies. Well, it turns out that beyond the mast cell histamine connection, and we know that histamine is tied to allergies, right? We take antihistamines because antihistamines reduce allergies. We take Benadryl, we take Claritin, we take Zyrtec, we take Zysol to control histamine levels to mitigate allergies. Well, it turns out the molds themselves can actually trigger allergies, and they have been directly tied to eczema, and I've seen horrendous cases of eczema as a result of mold exposure. And in fact, every single severe case of eczema that I've seen was mold exposure. Severe cases of asthma where you do inhaled steroids and that poor child is still ending up in their emergency department, that was mold exposure. Severe runny nose where the child is congested all the time, not, not seasonally, not like, oh, there, there, there's a little bit of pollen and this kid is you know, congested for a few minutes. This is like year round, constantly coughing, constantly congested, constantly getting sick, massive tonsils, massive adenoids. That can be mold exposure. And what do we see? We see that children who are on the spectrum and Asperger's have abnormally high levels of atopic dermatitis, eczema, asthma, runny nose. They have high IgE levels, which is basically part of the immune response that mediates allergies. And in a large sample of children in the US who had autism, they ultimately was, were found to have high prevalence of allergic conditions and food, sensitive, food allergies. And we'll touch on that in a second. What's interesting is we see this and ultimately they say, well, this is an idiopathic condition. What does that mean? Basically, they're like, we don't know why it's happening. We do know why it's happening. And one of the explanations is mold. Not, not that it's the only explanation. It's not the only cause in all children. By no means am I saying that. But it can absolutely be a cause in some percentage, 5%, 50%, we don't know. One in 10 to one in two 10% to 50% of all children in this country are exposed to mold. In high humidity levels, where humidity levels are 90% all the time for several months, that is a recipe for mold growth. And we need to look at this. We see certain other things. 
that it's not just the children, but it turns out that one in three of children who are autistic have family members who have allergy reactions. And those allergy reactions are much more prevalent than the rest of the population. How would you express, explain a parent having weird allergy issues with a child who has allergy or who has autism? How would you explain that? These things are not coincidences. They're not just anecdotal things that, that have no meaning. They all have meaning. And when we start looking, we start seeing all of these connections come together. What's really troubling is when you look at certain data, such as if mom has history of hay fever, allergies, eczema, she has a 200%, a twofold increased risk of having a child with autism. If that is not enough to terrify you, if that is not enough to have you take action, if that is not enough for us to start saying, holy Jesus, what percentage of what we call autism is mold exposure? I don't know what is. And this is not all the data that there is. I will demonstrate to you how many other correlations there are between autism and mold exposure. This is a beautifully done study looking at how perinatal, which is early mast cell activity that they say could be tied to infection, stress, or environmental triggers. What is that environmental trigger? Well, one thing that can cause mast cell activity early, early in life is early mold exposure. That activity can lead to the release of pro-inflammatory and neurotoxic toxic to the brain chemicals that can ultimately contribute to brain inflammation and ASD pathogenesis, which basically means the process that leads to the manifestation of autism. How can we overlook this data that is just staring us in the face? And it's not to say that mold is the only thing that causes autism by any means. This is not to say the mold is the only thing that causes mast cell activity by any means. This is a beautiful research diagram by Bob Miller, who's just as brilliant of a man. And if you haven't checked him out, every single person needs to start paying attention to Bob Miller. He's a genius and the information that he puts out is absolutely brilliant. What Bob Miller helps us see is how many different things can ultimately lead to mast cell activity, environmental toxins, mold, a host of different things. But if the host of different things lead to the instability within the mast cells, and if mold shows up, then it's the thing that pulls that trigger and causes the mast cell to go nuts, we start understanding how this picture can be coming together. But this conversation goes beyond even those things. There are two things, two things that ultimately control the fight flight arousal systems of the nervous system. So they are the two things that help us have alertness. There's glutamate, which is why we take magnesium, why we take GABA to counterbalance glutamate. And I'll touch on that a little bit later. And there's histamine. If you've ever taken Benadryl or you've given Benadryl to your kid and you knocked out, the reason why Benadryl works so well is because Benadryl is an antihistamine. Benadryl knocks out histamine levels within the nervous system, which then causes us to fall asleep. It basically takes the air out of the balloon and causes that balloon to fall. Now, what if you had the opposite. Instead of too little, too little histamine, you had way too much histamine in that nervous system. So that, his, that nervous system was buzzing at 150 miles an hour. You know, I, I tell parents, I'm like, it's like your child has had 15 cups of coffee every day and they, they just literally can't settle down. And like, yeah, that's exactly what's happening to my kid. They can't settle down at all, ever. Now, and a lot of these kids, what do we do? We give them GABA, we give them magnesium, we give them L-theanine. And if you go you know, pharmaceutical route, we give them guanfacine, we give them anxiolytics, we give them a host of different things without ever asking like, why in God's good earth is this child's nervous system unable to calm down? Well, 
not only can mold toxins affect glutamate, and we'll touch on that later, but it turns out that mold toxins, as I demonstrated, cause an abnormality in the mast cell activity, which then causes a huge amount of histamine release, which can then cause abnormalities within the nervous system. Wakefulness, arousal systems are influenced by histamine. Ultimately, histamine can affect a host of other neuroregulatory compounds, AC, ACTH, beta endorphins. It can change neurochemical pathways like norepinephrine, dopamine. These are neuroexcitatory compounds. Norepinephrine is adrenaline. Histamine controls adrenaline within the nervous system. But it's not just that. Histamine also changes appetite. And what do we see in children with autism? So many of them just have very little appetite, right? They barely eat enough to survive. What do we see in children with pans and pandas, this, this brain inflammatory condition? The diagnostic criteria, one of the ways that physicians diagnose pans and pandas is a sudden change in appetite, where the kid was eating and all of a sudden is not eating. And yet, we don't even bother to say, why in God's good earth did this child suddenly stop eating? If you have an abnormality in histamine, appetite centers go to hell. They, they completely shut off. They, they become completely dysregulated. And one of the things that I've seen is when you give enzymes within the gastrointestinal tract, which is where the mast cell instability is happening, you give enzymes, these DAO enzymes that break down histamine, one of the things that happens is we, when you break down histamine, when you degrade the histamine, you lower the histamine, suddenly the kid's appetite comes back. Some gastroenterologists use a compound called ciproheptidine, which is an old antihistamine that happens to work really well in the gastrointestinal tract. Why? Because they're trying to lower histamine levels and thus cause kids who are Picky eaters, failure to thrive, kids that just will not eat for the life of them to start eating. Histamine has a powerful control on appetite, and I'll touch on how it also affects other areas of eating. Histamine does more than that. It turns out that one of the things that histamine can do on top of promoting anxiety, why do you get anxiety? Well, if you are on 15 cups of coffee every day, all day, and you also have excitatory effects in other parts of the brain, you will become anxious. Histamine can affect learning. It can affect memory. But one of the things that is also critical about the role of histamine is how it affects the vestibular system. What is the vestibular system? The vestibular system is our balance control center. It's the key balance control center of the brain. Why is that important? Well, Thanks to the occupational therapy world, and they published hundreds of papers on this, it turns out that the vestibular system plays a profound role in sensory processing. Let me say this again. The vestibular system impacts sensory processing, which is how our brain takes in information and processes information. So not only is the traffic control center of the brain, the traffic control parts of the brain sluggish, not only are these traffic control cops chronically fatigued and falling asleep at the job, it turns out that the way the information comes into the brain to then be controlled and regulated is also distorted. The vestibular system at a lower brain level controls how information comes into the brain. When you have an abnormality in the vestibular system, Sensory integration goes to hell. Sensory integration gets messed up. How does that show up? Well, the first thing is because the balance centers are off, you get the kid who, who just cannot sit still for the life of them. The kid who gets up 15,000 times, Johnny, sit down. Your kid will not sit still. He is constantly disrupting the classroom. Johnny, sit down. Those poor kids who have the itch to move every 15 seconds, they're not trying to be a pain in anyone's rear end. They're, they're, they're not intentionally doing any of what we see. What we call ADHD in 50 plus percent of kids 
is actually a sensory integration problem. It's actually a vestibular problem. This is scientifically proven within the occupational therapy literature. What is causing the vestibular dysregulation, that vestibular abnormality? Histamine is one significant thing that does that. And I've, I've seen hundreds of cases where I give this diamine oxidase, this DAO enzyme, we degrade the histamine within the gut. And then all of a sudden, the kid that, that was ants in the pants, couldn't sit still, constantly fidgeting, constantly moving, constantly all over the place, is suddenly calm, is suddenly able to sit still. Constantly movement goes to, wow, he is finally still. This is how powerful this conversation is. This is how significant this conversation is. But it goes beyond just kid can't sit still. Indirectly and directly, so through the vestibular system and through other direct pathways, histamine can also impact every other sensory processing pathway there is. Let me say that again. Histamine can directly impact every other sensory pathway that is there. And these have been tied to the presentation of autism. Auditory pathways. So these poor kids, what are they telling us? The world is too loud. The, the world is too loud. All, all the sound is, is too much. I can't handle it. Why? Because their auditory pathways are disrupted. And some of the kids that we call learning challenged, when you specifically look at what happens to these kids, one of the things that we find is that these kids have a problem with how they can process the sound that their brain is receiving. These kids do fine when it's one-on-one -on -one and someone is talking to them with zero distraction in the environment. Why? Because there's nothing else that their brain has to pay attention to other than the sound of that person who is talking to them, except when you add 20 other kids, an air conditioning unit that's turning on, a clock that's ticking, the child next to them tapping their pencil on their table. And now there's all of this other sensory information. These kids are lost because these kids are listening to the tapping, air conditioning unit, the clock, and everything else simultaneously, which means they're processing nothing. And that is why some of these kids struggle. That's why some of these kids can't handle the sensory information from the world around them. But it's not just that. Their body awareness is off. Their motor planning is off. How does that show up? These clumsy kids that are constantly fumbling, constantly falling, they're clumsy. Why are kids clumsy? Like, Why would a child be clumsy? We just say, oh, well, some kids are clumsy. We'll just do enough physical therapy to get them better. And I have nothing against physical therapy. I think it's amazing. I think occupational therapy is amazing. And I recommend it all the time. Why do these issues happen in the first place? We need to ask that question first before we spend $40,000 per year on these therapies that can be amazing, but only after we have addressed the primary issue. What is olfactory and smell? Well, God, what if your sense of smell is distorted? One, there, there are poor children on, on the spectrum who can't handle any kind of smell. If a family is eating a meal, that kid has to be in the next room because just the sound of the knife and fork clanking on the plate and the smell of it is overwhelming. You add the sense of distorted smell with the sense of distorted touch. And it's not just these kids can't wear clothing. What happens to the sense of touch within the mouth? A lot of neurotypic kids who have these abnormalities have come out and said, food is absolutely disgusting to me. I hate eating because it's gross. Why do kids eat chicken nuggets, mac and cheese, and, and peanut butter and jelly? Because, I mean, they, they, one, they don't have to chew the food. They can just swallow it. And the texture of those foods feels comfortable in their mouth. It's the only texture of food that feels comfortable in the mouth. So we have these kids that, that are failure to thrive. They're eating four foods and then some well-intending doctor comes along and says, well, you need to change your kid's diet and get rid of gluten and dairy and all of these things. And, and now the kid is completely stuck. Well, first, it would be really helpful to 
change the sensory experience of that child by decreasing the histamine levels. And I've seen this hundreds of times. You give the, these simple enzymes, histamine levels come down. All of a sudden, the kid is not overwhelmed by the world. They're not overwhelmed by their senses. They're able to eat foods. And I ha I've had countless kids with no therapy at all, no feeding therapy, no nothing. You change this kid who is eating mac and cheese, chicken nuggets. One other thing, six months later is now eating broccoli and salmon. And like the parents are like, oh my God, this, this is amazing. It's, it, it's science. And we can bring about this change if we start understanding why the problem showed up in the first place. How about visual tracking? One of the telltale signs that I find in children who are mold exposed is difficulty reading. These are obviously kids who have the ability to be able to read. Normal typical kids are in high functioning autism, but a lot of these kids hate reading. They struggle, they're slow readers. And if you really pay close attention, what happens? Their eyeballs are constantly bouncing between line to line. Yeah, they're, they're reading five words and all of a sudden they're reading the line below and then, or they're just super slow readers and they have to use a ruler or their finger to trace the line. Why do they have to do that? Because their visual tracking system, which basically means how their two eyeballs follow the line is distorted. These kids are also extremely clumsy. Their hand-eye coordination is usually not fantastic. Sometimes you throw a ball, it hits them right smack in the face. And we push these kids, we, we ask, we force these kids you just need to read more because you, you, you're not doing a good job. Well, my God, if the child's eyes, if the child's hearing, if the child's brain is not processing the information, shouldn't we try to fix that first? And we have tools. We have the capacity. We, there's so many amazing things that can be done if we understand what is happening in the first place. Beyond the learning challenges, the the part the part that is most disturbing the part that is heartbreaking imagine if every day of your life imagine if every day of your life you're living in a state of brain fog imagine if every day of your life you're just exhausted because you have no energy if every day of your life you're anxious because your nervous system is just buzzing and every day of your life you're bombarded with so much sensory information, the environment is too loud. You don't even know where objects are. You keep constantly running into things. Going up and down stairs is a nightmare. And you're asked to do this every day with no compassion. No compassion. You're just, why aren't you doing this? Come on. Come on. These kids are suffering. These kids are struggling. These kids are barely surviving. And why so many kids come home from school and they're just fall apart is because they were in a battle zone all day. And they, they just can't even understand you can't even understand why. There's a reason why. It's because they're struggling. And It's because they're struggling. And when we understand the reason for their struggle, that is when we can really help. We can transform the lives of these kids. We can give them such a better life, such a better experience. And I love the community's movement to promote neurodivergence. I love the fact that we have become accepting of neurodivergence. Frankly, that there's 
parts of me that are neurodivergent. I, I can't understand social cues for the life of me. There, there are simple, simple things that, that are so easy for other people to get, and I just can't get them for the life of me. I've had auditory processing issues. I've had tactile sensitivity. And I've had to learn how to address these things for myself. What I have a problem with is this thing where we believe that neurodivergence has to mean disability. We believe that neurodivergence has to mean struggle. We believe that neurodivergence has to mean suffering. Neurodivergence does not have to mean suffering. Neurodivergence does not have to mean a struggle. Neurodivergence is the magical part of that beautiful human being that is before us. The magical part that allows them to think of things, process things, come up with things that will probably help save us from this mess that we have created in our world. Neurodivergence is not the lack of health. Neurodivergence is not the presence of disease. And we need to start looking at this differently. And as we start looking at all these pieces, we get to a place where we, really, we realize how many different things are simultaneously happening in these poor children that are on the spectrum and not like pants and pandas that are happening simultaneously, mitochondrial errors, immune abnormalities, gut microbiome, sensory pathways, mast cell activity, on and on and on. And when all of these things come together, that is what causes suffering. That is not neurodivergence. One of the other things is that mycotoxins can cause a profound and powerful, and this, this is the words of the researcher, not me, a profound activation of the neuroglia, especially the microglia. These, what is the neuroglia? These are immune cells within the brain. Mycotoxins can cause inflammation and activation of the immune system within the brain. And this has been tied to autism. Now, why is this important? Well, it turns out that, first of all, children with autism have this microglial activation. It also turns out that this microglial activation has been tied to severe cases of OCD, Tourette's syndrome, and PANDAS. Why is this so important? Well, it turns out that there's this part of the brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala is the part of the brain that ultimately controls our fear response. It, it helps us understand how to gauge the threats within the world. And it turns out that when the amygdala gets disrupted, when the amygdala gets distorted, Fear-related behaviors start showing up in very unusual ways. What happens to kids with pans and pandas? They completely lose any and all sense of gauging what is real or not. They have irrational and weird patterns of fear reactions to seemingly benign things. Oh my God, that, that spider is going to kill me. Oh my God. They're, they're constantly in a threat response. They're constantly fearful of their environments. They have weird OCD patterns where they have to wash their hands 15,000 times and they have to do these things in repetitive fashion. Why? Because certain core areas of their nervous system are distorted. What about children with autism? They're in a constant stress response. These poor, poor souls are constantly stressed because every moment the entire world is overwhelming to them. This world is too much. This world is too much. I'm overwhelmed. I'm scared is what they're telling us. And it's because they are overwhelmed. It's because they are scared. It's because the world is overwhelming. And yet we are completely oblivious to why this is happening to them. Stimulation of brain mass cells or microglia may disrupt neuronal connectivity 
in the amygdala, thereby altering the normal threshold. This process can at least explain in some part the pathogenesis of ASD, of autism spectrum, of pans and pandas. Mold toxicity, especially early on in life, can do this very thing. And I've seen it in hundreds of cases. Mold toxicity can do this very thing. And yet we are not even talking about it. What about the nervous system as a whole? Well, it turns out that mycotoxins also disrupt the brain and the nervous system. So the first thing that they're highly capable of doing is actually disrupting the, the blood-brain barrier. They, they, they disrupt the integrity of the lining of the brain that is meant to protect the brain from the outside environment. And you can see that it doesn't take a whole lot. At low concentrations, these compounds, T2 is trichothecenes, or a type of mycotoxin, can ultimately compromise the blood-brain barrier. And these findings have been tied to children with autism. They have been tied to children with other neurological abnormalities. Aspergillus, which is a type of really nasty mold that is very common in contaminated environments, can ultimately mimic the actions of the compounds of the brain that can cause neuroexcitation. So beyond everything that we talked about, beyond the histamine, beyond the amygdala, beyond the microglia, beyond all of these things, these molds can directly create compounds that can be neuroexcitatory and cause abnormalities within the neurochemistry of the brain. Ochratoxins, which is a very common toxin that we are not regulating in this country, can cause persistent activation of NMDA receptors. What are NMDA receptors? Well, remember we said there are two excitatory compounds in the brain. There's glutamate and there is histamine. Well, we talked about histamine. Guess what? Mold toxins can also disrupt the receptors that mediate the glutamate response in the brain. And what's weird is these ochratoxins and other toxins can actually cause these receptors to either be over-responsive and over-activated or also under-responsive and under-activated. Depending on a host of different reasons, you can get abnormalities that go in both directions. What do we see in children with autism? NMDA and glutamate abnormalities. What do we see ch with children with pans and pandas? Similar findings. It is time for us to start talking about this and taking this connection very seriously. Remember we talked about the folate receptor antibodies and I said there's actually more to the story than that? Well, it turns out there is more to that. So beyond the folate receptor antibodies, and frankly, we have no idea what percentage of these folate receptor antibodies may be related to mycotoxins. What we do know, what we do know is that early exposure can actually change how much folate is getting into the brain because of the fact that folate needs a transporter, that transporter can directly be impacted by these mycotoxins. And what you see in the graphs down below is that as toxin levels go up, which is going to the right, blood, cere blood folate level or cerebral spinal fluid levels, so brain folate levels, drop. Higher mycotoxins, lower brain folate. We see children with midline defects. We see children that, that have all kinds of abnormalities. And we have no idea why these things happen. Children with autism have disruption in blood brain folate transport. That we do know. And we do know that these abnormalities can be caused with early mold exposure. What about cognition? What about our ability to think and just be in the world? 
these are all the things that have been attributed to mold exposure. So learning, short-term working memory. What is working memory? Well, working memory is basically the brain's RAM. It is the part of the brain that can store information actively to help us process that information and do something about it. One of the things that's very unique about working memory is when there's a problem in working memory, children struggle to learn math. Why? Because with math, you have to take in a concept, process that concept, and then ultimately put it into long-term memory. One of the things that I see commonly as one strong telltale sign that there is mold exposure is that the child is struggling to learn math. A lot of times these children also have weird things, like they're also struggling to read. We know that if you have a visual tracking error, your ability to read plummets. It turns out that you can have abnormalities in other areas. You get inattention, you get executive function abnormalities. Yeah, my, my kid just can't follow any directions. I tell them to go, go to the room and put on their shoes and God, why is he being so difficult? These poor kids are not trying to be difficult. They're not trying to be a pain to anyone. They're struggling. They're struggling to function. And the saddest part is that over time, these kids come to call themselves dumb. I've had kids call themselves idiots. Eight-year-olds, I'm an idiot. I'm dumb. I'm stupid. They're not stupid. They're not dumb. They're not idiots. Their nervous systems are falling apart. Their nervous systems are falling apart, and we as a society are failing to understand why it is happening. And we medicate these kids. And I have nothing against medications. I prescribe Ritalin. I prescribe these medications. I encourage families to use, talk to a psychiatrist when it's appropriate. I have an issue when we medicate kids without asking why they are struggling why these kids are, are, are struggling to learn, why they're calling themselves dumb, why they're calling themselves idiots. Mycotoxins can cause profound abnormalities in one's ability to learn, in one's ability to process, in one's ability to function cognitively. And we need to take this data seriously. Mycotoxins can cause mental confusion, moderate to severe levels of cognitive disability that ultimately can be ult ultimately tied to traumatic brain injury. There are varying degree of mental status changes, altered attention, blunted executive function. These are additional studies. And the longer the exposure, the longer and more severe the abnormalities. These things are real. And I see this all the time, even in children on, not on the spectrum. These kids struggle to function, and why they struggle to function is because their nervous systems are completely shot. Think about the worst case of brain fog you've ever had in your life. Think of the time you had the flu, and you just couldn't think for, for the life of you, or, or for those of you that have had COVID, and your, your brain was just completely shot, and you couldn't remember, you couldn't think, you couldn't function, you just... Everything was just a horrendous fog. Imagine that being your everyday experience of life from the moment you were in school. And then we wonder why these kids don't want to learn. We wonder why these kids fall apart, why, why they quit. Who would want to learn? Who would enjoy school? If every day is a nightmare, and every day is a struggle and you're working as hard as you can. And these kids try so hard. They try so hard. And yet they struggle and they can't. And they see their friends doing well. They see their kids, their friends are learning. And their, their friends are not even trying. And they're getting bees and they're, they're killing themselves. They're spending hours. They're spending hours working. And they're still getting C's and D's. Why would you want to continue in school? Who would want to continue in school if this is your experience? 
would want to continue in school? Who, who would want to learn if this is your experience all the time? We have to start taking this seriously. There are millions upon millions of kids who are struggling who are on the spectrum or not that is potentially tied to mold toxicity and we are completely ignorant of it. One of the other things that mold toxins can do is weird neurological changes related to EEGs, ab abnormalities, and tics. One of the telltale signs for me that there is mold exposure is the child who, who struggles in math, who struggles to learn, who has brain fog and has tics. A lot of these kids also have weird vestibular issues. How does that show up? Well, if this is your experience all the time, One of the other unusual findings with mold toxicity, with mold exposure, are, are weird neurological abnormalities, such as motor tics, involuntary movements that the kids have very little control over, or frank EEG changes. I've, I've had countless kids look like they were having a seizure, and ultimately they went to see the neurologist, and the neurologist did an EEG, and what the neurologist said is like, God, there's something there. The EEG is not normal, but it is not epilepsy. I don't know what it is. There are many kids who are having these abnormalities. And when you look, it's all around us. And we have no idea what to make of it. Children who are on the spectrum have tick-like reactions. Children on the spectrum have very, 70%, high rates of abnormal EEGs, and yet we have no explanation for why this is happening. There is an explanation, mold toxicity. What about nutrients? What about one's ability to absorb the foods we eat? These are animal studies that have shown that, at least in animals, again, we have no idea what happens in humans, but exposure to these mold toxins can produce iron deficiency anemia. Exposure to these toxins can ultimately deplete zinc because zinc does not absorb from the gastrointestinal tract. It can cause malabsorption of various types of carotenoids, which we need for a host of different things, including immune regulation. The labs that you're seeing on the bottom are from one of my patients. This is a real patient where iron levels were non-existent, zinc levels non-existent, severe anemia. And there are many patients that I see that come to me where the child had a weirdly low zinc level, weirdly low iron level, except they were eating all of the foods. And you know the only thing that they thought is like, well, it's not colitis, it's not celiac, so just give your kid more iron and everything will be fine. Except the kid also has learning issues and the kid also has other abnormalities. We have to start looking at these things and putting them together. Beyond the actual mineral absorption, mycotoxins ultimately disrupt protein synthesis, which you think about what protein synthesis is, is needed for just about everything. They change the lipid membranes of the cells. So the lipid membranes are basically the fats that surround the cells. They change the fat makeup of our cells, which ultimately cause the cells to not function appropriately. And guess what? This has been tied to children who have autism. I'm not saying that mold is the only thing that is capable of doing this. Not at all. Lyme disease, Lyme co-infections, COVID, glyphosates, heavy metals, plastics, other environmental toxins can cause similar disruptions. And part of why we may now be seeing this 
epidemic of mold toxicity where you know people say, well, why wasn't it there 20, 30 years ago? But first of all, 30, 40 years ago, we weren't using drywall left and right in every home. The, the quality of homes were different. Homes were leaky and air was going in and out of homes. They weren't insulated. But we also didn't have all of these other environmental toxins. We didn't have a host of other things that were causing the systems to become vulnerable enough to the point to the point where now mycotoxins would have been sufficient to cause the system to collapse, to cause the system to fall apart. Now, a lot of people, researchers especially, will be like, well, correlation is not causation. And they're absolutely right. Correlation is not causation ever. But I would really love for anyone that is being critical of this information is to give one one single other explanation of how all of these unusual things that we see in autism and frankly pans and pandas and a host of other things one thing that can cause and explain all of these correlations one one hypothesis i would love for these people that say well th this this can't be th th these are correlations and they're loose correlations give one one physiological singular explanation that can cause, that can explain all of these findings that we see in these poor individuals who are challenged by autism and struggle in their lives. You know, a lot of people say, well, neurodivergence is, is part of who they are. Absolutely. I mean, when I'm unhealthy, many people would probably qualify me as neurodivergent. I, ha I have the inability to understand social cues. I, I don't understand some of the things that are so common to others. Being neurodivergent doesn't mean someone has to suffer. Being neurodivergent doesn't mean that every day has to be a struggle. Being neurodivergent doesn't mean that someone has to be unhealthy. And for all those people that are confusing these two, they are confusing what neurodivergence is. Neurodivergence is a gift. And right now with the mess that we're creating for ourselves, my God, we need more talented, gifted, smart people to try to figure out a way out of this mess that we have created. Just because there is neurodivergence, just because children have a different way that their nervous systems are wired does not mean that they need to struggle. It doesn't mean that they need to be disabled. It doesn't mean that they need to be unhealthy. It doesn't mean that their systems need to be collapsing. And as we understand why children on the spectrum and children not on the spectrum are struggling as much as they are, and as we understand how things like mold toxicity is contributing to their struggle, we can finally figure out how to help all of these individuals. And most importantly, for all of those researchers and legislatures and policymakers out there listening, we can finally figure out how to prevent these challenges from showing up that causes these poor individuals to struggle and causes them to be overwhelmed every moment of their life, and ultimately how to save our society from countless costs that are needed to take care of these individuals because they are struggling. Ultimately, we have no idea what percentage of autism may be tied to early mode exposure. I certainly have no idea. Is it 1%? Is it 5%? Is it 50%? Is it 70%? We have no idea. We have no idea. And until a whole lot more people do a whole lot more research, we still will have no idea. The greatest challenges we face is that mold toxicity is almost impossible to identify through conventional labs. It is almost impossible to identify through conventional labs. You, you, conventional doctors would completely miss it because you can't see it in conventional testing. The current diagnostic modalities that we have are I hate to use the word pitiful. They're pitiful. They're woefully inadequate. The degree of false negatives that we see, including the fancy three, $400 tests is, is staggering. 
if I want to be certain that a child actually does or does not have mold exposure or toxicity, and because the toxicity can happen from before, I have to run three different tests from three different companies at the cost of around $800 to have some idea of if this child has been affected. Otherwise, any one of the tests can either give a false positive or a false negative. Home inspectors regularly miss small amounts of mold. And they see the abnormality. They see the child's room has a spike in aspergillus, even though the rest of the house and the outside of the house didn't. But that's a small problem and is not a big deal. And we have to change our building standards. We have to change our testing standards. We have to completely stand back and actually look at this from a completely different lens. And for those of you that think like, well, God, that's that's too much. That's going to be too costly. Well, Jesus, the cost of autism, the cost of mental health that is unfolding in this country, if, if that's not costly, if that's not a burden, I don't know what you consider it to be. So for those people that say, well, we can't, we can't change these things. It's going to take too much effort. I guess the effort of caring for all of these poor individuals that are suffering and the cost of taking care of these individuals, these poor kids in the schools that need one-on-one -on -one aids because they're, they're constantly fritzing out. They're constantly falling apart. They're constantly overwhelmed. I guess that cost is not too big. We have to completely change how we're seeing this problem. And from a policy level, from an insurance level, from a testing level, from a diagnostic level, from a building standards level, we need to stand back and really take a serious look. Ultimately, there needs to be a much, much, much higher degree of awareness around mold as it pertains to autism and frankly, all mental health disorders. We need, we need a huge rise, a huge surge in research to really look at this and to understand what is real, what is not, because right now we have no data. Most of the studies that I've referenced, sadly, are from animal studies. They're from clinical studies. They're, they're from laboratory studies. We have to get real and understand that the data is there and the data, the data is troubling. And now we need to actually put that into real life and understand how that is impacting the mental health epidemic that we are seeing in this country and frankly around the world. We need companies and researchers to start developing much higher effective, accurate diagnostic tests that hopefully will be covered by insurance where every single child can be screened in a very effective fashion. Are they being exposed to mold or not? Oh, Jesus, they're being exposed. The same way we're checking for lead. If we're checking for lead at one year of age, at nine months of age, we should be doing exactly the same thing for mold exposure. And if there's mold exposure as a society, we need to say, okay, this child is being exposed. What do we need to do to fix it? Because the cost of fixing that problem will ultimately be astronomically cheaper than not. The millions of dollars we pay to take care of an individual who has been affected by autism and the disability that they are suffering is significantly higher than if we had spent ten dollars or $20,000 to fix the home. We need to start looking at this differently, and we need to find effective solutions. The solutions are out there. We just need to find them. We need to start talking about them. We need to start looking at all of this. And this only happens once we start becoming aware. And we start becoming aware as a society, as a population, at every level, from legislatures all the way down to parents and their physicians. How do you know if you or your family have been exposed? The, the simplest thing is you look around. If your child has some kind of mental health challenge and your memory as a parent has also been shot and you can't even remember the basic things that you used to or you're chronically fatigued or you have weird immune reactions, you've got 15 different allergies and you wake up congested every morning, 
every morning. Your menstrual cycles are off. You've had chronic gastroenterologic issues and you've got irritable bowel syndrome. Well, if you've got irritable bowel syndrome and your child is having some kind of thing and your husband's brain fog is, is disabling them, well, don't you think it's possible that all of these are tied together? This presentation is not to induce fear. This presentation is to increase awareness. This presentation is to help us start seeing the possible answers that are sitting right underneath our noses. What I tell all of our, my families that have been exposed to mold is at least there is a solution. Mold toxicity can be in some cases, fully reversed. In, in, in children with autism, I, I've seen children with autism do so much better. The kid that was completely overwhelmed every time they would go into every environment is now going out to restaurants and going to church and socializing and smiling and making eye contact. The kids that were having panic attacks and anxiety and OCD are suddenly not. Immune abnormality suddenly becoming normal. The gastroenterologic issues improving. Allergies improving. Mold toxicity, for the most part, can't be reversed. That damages from mold toxins can be healed. The most beautiful part of this, and this is the part that I pray for as, I, as I've done this presentation, this can be prevented. More than treating, more than healing, if we get to a place of awareness at a societal policy legislative level, we can prevent this. And through the prevention, through this healing, God knows how many millions upon millions of individuals who have been struggling, who have been suffering, who have been disabled can finally find relief, can finally be given hope. All of those kids that are dropping out of school, I'm too dumb, I'm too stupid, I can't learn. They give up on life. Kids that can't manage their emotions, the kids that, that can't regulate themselves, the kids that are just constantly getting in trouble, except it's not their fault. It's not their fault. They're not trying to be difficult. They're not trying to cause problems. They can finally find relief. They can finally regulate themselves. And through that, learn they're not bad. They're not a problem. They're good. They're kind. They're smart. They're capable. And if we could change this early, early on, all of those kids that give up on learning, all those kids that give up on trying. And sadly, those are the kids that end up incarcerated. Those are the kids that, that end up disabled. They certainly don't go off to college. They certainly don't go on to have bright futures. Why? Because every day is a war zone for them. Every day is a struggle. Every day they just they're just they're just trying to survive. How can you thrive if you're just trying to survive? There are millions of kids where their futures are robbed because of this. And we can change that. And we can change that through conversations. We can change that through awareness. We can change that through policy change, through research, through understanding. And that all starts with you sharing this video with as many people as possible, including those that have the ability to make change, including those that have the ability to finally start doing the research, empowering companies to find better tools to identify if this exposure is happening. Together, we can change this. We can help so many kids, so many adults have happier, healthier, productive lives. And that all starts with you. And with all of this, I want to say thank you. I thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I thank you for having an open mind and an open heart to receive this information.
Because honestly speaking, five years ago, I had no idea that mold was even a problem. I, I wouldn't have even had a clue to, to think about it for most of my patients. And initially, when I encountered this information, my initial instinct was like, you, you got to be kidding me. There's, there's no way mold can be causing such an issue. Until I opened my eyes and started doing the research and started training with wondrous people like Dr. Neil Nathan, who's been one of my most remarkable teachers. And through all of this, I came to realize how huge this problem can be. We don't know the total scope of what mold toxicity is doing to the children. We don't truly understand how big this problem is, but at least from my anecdotal observation, I think it's a lot bigger than we realize. I hope you share this information with others. I hope you can get this information into the hands of other parents who have been struggling to figure out what's going on with their child. I hope those of you who can get this information into the hands of other physicians so the physicians can start opening their eyes and say, oh my God, is this happening to my patients? And ultimately together, we also get this video into the hands of legislatures and those that are in power that can influence policy because that's how we bring about change by bringing awareness to our entire society from parents all the way up to physicians and ultimately all the way up to legislators we can bring about change we can prevent an enormous amount of suffering and you know a lot of people say well autism is just autism and I want to say autism is the miraculous part of the human being. It's what makes them so special. It's what makes them beautiful. Their suffering, the suffering that all children have, whether it's autism and the disability that they experience from the unhealthy part of what may be mold toxicity, which is not their neurodivergence, or other children who are having anxiety, ADHD, OCD, whatever it is. We can change this, and we can change this through awareness. For those of you that want to reach out, you're welcome to email us, follow us on Instagram. And for those of you that are asking, what the heck do I do? There's a lot of information out there. Dr. Neil Nathan has books out there. Dr. Jill Krista has courses out there. And for those of you that want, follow us on Holistic Minds. The whole purpose of Holistic Minds is to help get information into the hands of families and their providers. Because what I believe is through awareness, we start seeing what's going on. And what I hope is that Holistic Minds can empower you and your provider to then take the steps you need to take to ultimately bring about change, to bring about healing. I hope that as a society, we can bring about transformations that are currently unimaginable. Children who are struggling, I, I hope we can create a bright, bright, beautiful future where, yes, the child may be different. The child may have their differences, which is beautiful, but they're not struggling. They're not suffering. They're not bound by the disability that unhealth, the lack of health is causing them. I want health to, to show up for everyone who is interested. And that is what we can create together. So thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you for sharing this information with others. You be well. This is Dr. K.